Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. Good day, everybody from all over the world, wherever you're joining us from. Um, it's great to have you here. So thank you so much for joining us. So without taking much of our time, we have our speaker in the house and uh, we're great to go. So um, I'm going to start with um, a brief intro. So today we're going to be looking at introduction to Spark with R. So our agenda for today is going to be, we're welcoming all our participants and we're glad to have you join us today again. So I'm going to also introduce the organizers of Our Ladies Abuja and a brief intro into who we are. Then I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. Then I'll hand over to our speaker to take over the floor and then the Q&A will be in between as the program is going on. So then the final will be to give a big thank you to everybody. Yeah. So um, my name is Belikisu Olatunji. So I'm a data scientist and the uh, founder of Business Data Laboratory here in Abuja, Nigeria. So I have also Abiodun Egwenu. She's a field epidemiologist. So she's also an AMR, AMR program manager with the Nigeria Center for Disease Control here in Nigeria as well. She's based also in Abuja. So we also have Dr. Mabel Ajumobi. She is a deputy director, assistant chief vet officer here in Abuja as well with the Federal Ministry of Agric and Rural Development. So we are the local organize, uh, organization um, an affiliate of Our Ladies Global here in Abuja, Nigeria. So we are also based on the goals and um, vision of Our Ladies Global. So we empower ourselves as ladies here in Abuja to foster the knowledge of and the usage of R in our society, both in the academics and also in the professional field. So that's just the basic thing about us. So I'm going to go ahead to introduce our speaker today, which I'm really honored to have him here. So I'll go off the camera so that we can focus on him more. <laughs> So, okay, today we're going to be having Edgar Ruse. I hope I pronounced the name well. Okay, okay, good. So he's a software engineer with POSIT, formerly known as R Studio PBC. So Edgar co-authored a book called Mastering Spark with R, the DB Plier, DB Plier package, and he's currently the maintainer of the Spark layer package, the Spark L-Y-R package. So for those who are not familiar with it. So we're basically looking at um, getting ourselves started. So I know it might be a big word, but we're going to get used to it. <laughs> okay. So Spark L-Y-R package is being maintained right now by Edgar. So Edgar has also authored multiple articles and blog posts sharing analytics insights and server infrastructure for data science. He has a background in deploying enterprise reporting and business intelligence so, um, reporting. That's is, is the, um, he has a background in deploying enterprise reporting and business intelligence solutions. He loves to promote how to best use R for enterprise by helping publish articles, articulate examples, and many other ways. And part of that is also featuring in our webinar today. So we are really glad to have you here, Edgar. So thank you so much. I'm honored to have you here. Thank you. So I'm... Um... You're, you're on mute. You were on mute when you said that last part. Oh, okay. Okay, I hope I... The introduction, did you get it? When you turn off your uh, your sharing, you want to meet. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for having me today. It's an honor for me as well to be able to share the work that we've been doing. Uh, and the main thing with me is that being able to share with the community is so important to me um, to be able to put these things, the tools that we work on, and also how to use them properly for 
benefit of your analysis is something very important to me. Uh, so I'd love to do these kinds of talks. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and, and start sharing. Um, so we're gonna do an introduction to, to Spark with R. In these kinds of uh, conversations, uh, unless it's a very specific subject um, within, you know, the uh, some analytic thing that we need to talk about, some modeling, um, the, I'm going to do something like more introductory to starting with what is Spark and also kind of how we think about data science and how that fits whenever we actually use um, Spark uh, and how we um, want to integrate with it if, uh, if we're using R. So. The first thing I want to show is the, the data science workflow, right? Um, hopefully, if you've seen the, uh, the book uh, about uh, art for data science, you've seen the, the steps, right? You, you bring in the data, you tidy the data, you transform the data, uh, you visualize it, then you model it, and then you go into this, you know, uh, cycle where we gather understanding. And then when we understand it uh, and we find, um, and we have our, uh, things that the, the insights that we gain from uh, the analysis, we're able to communicate, right? Um, and what's so nice about all this is that the, the entire thing from beginning to end, the, from the import to the communication can be done within R, right? That, that's why uh, it's, it has become so important in data scientists uh, every day uh, or daily life at work is because of this, right? That we can um, start and end in R, uh, and that, that's what we kind of want to continue on as we add all these other uh, backends, we can call them all these other tools that can help us uh, to enhance our analysis, right? Or analysis capabilities. Uh, you'll see you see the, the book that I mentioned, this is a link. So if you haven't seen it, you know, you can click on it once I share this, um, uh, the, the deck which I will. So the idea here is that a laptop, right? Or a machine that we have will be able to handle data to a that is a certain size, right? Uh, that we can analyze it um, and do everything that we need to do inside the, the machine because the, uh, you know, right. the, the data set that we're using or the multiple data sets do not add up to more than let's say, 10 gigabytes, 20 gigabytes, right? Uh, once they get bigger than that, it's a little bit problematic for us. We have to start thinking of ways to do this. Um, and the other thing is that what if the, the actual data itself is so bigger than even our laptop is as far as the hard drive, right? Uh, we have to think in different terms at that point uh, of how we interact with the data, right? So we don't think in terms of importing data anymore, uh, we think in, in different terms. So this is where Spark comes in. Uh, so let me go back here. I kind of switched too quickly. So we have to think in different terms, right? So this is what, where Spark comes in, how, how it can help us when it comes to these kinds of things. So Spark is a technology that has been around for a while now. Uh, I, I got interested in it pretty early on when it started because um, I used, I used I used to work at a bank that had big data sets and we needed to start analyzing a lot. So um, I became interested in how it worked. Uh, there's really nothing yet that um, is better than Spark in the open source world um, when it comes to what it does. So that's why we still talk about it. And then a lot of big companies still use it. Uh, I, I'm on calls uh, with different customers of Posit that using, are using Spark uh, even down to, to today, right? So Spark uh, lets us be able to analyze data that's bigger than disk or memory. That's, uh, that's what it does, essentially. Um, another cool thing about Spark that unlike uh, if you've been around the data world for a while, you've heard of Hadoop, for example, right? Uh, with Hadoop, you couldn't really um, be able to interact with it with SQL you had to do the map reduce stuff to be able to get the information uh, until something called Hive came along that lets you kind of do SQL, but it wasn't native, right? With Spark, SQL is native. And that's important to another thing that we're gonna talk about Spark VR. And um, beyond SQL, uh, Spark has additional transformations or transformers that allows it to go beyond what SQL does. Those kinds of transformers are very become very important once you become a, a machine learning practitioner um, because they are actually, we can say a sort of a shortcut 
to the transformations that we usually do with dplyr, uh, that we do uh, with tidyr, uh, and or if you're uh, already a machine learning practitioner and you're using it locally, you're using tidy models, it, that that's kind of comes into that uh, that avenue that, uh, of things that you would use to be able to prepare your data to run it to model, uh, to modeling. Um, Another thing that I think is so unique to Spark that for some reason has not been recreated anywhere else in the open source world is the ability to run machine learning routines inside the database, the, excuse me, the, the Spark environment. Um, when it comes to databases, right, we can run a lot of the transformations, right? A lot of the, uh, if let's talk about deep layer, you can do a lot of mutates, filters and all that stuff, but actually running uh, model linear regression something like that against a database is not possible because it doesn't have a you know run li linear regression SQL statement but with um, with spark th those things exist so you can run those things inside the uh, the cluster or inside the spark session and also allows the creation for formal modeling pipelines and this is something that um, starting a uh, couple of years back I'm pushing a lot for folks to think in those terms because that's where spark really shines when it comes to pipelines and i'll discuss more what they are here in a little bit and um also that another thing that sets it apart is that spark lets you cache stuff in memory so just a quick background um whenever big data started being a big thing right a, a few years back we heard a lot of the the data lakes and Hadoop and things like that so what Hadoop does is, and I'll show it here in a, in a, in a diagram, uh, it's uh, basically a way to be able to store a lot of data in hard drive. Uh, but somebody noted, hey, we're doing all this with hard drives, what are we doing with memory? Um, and that's what the idea for Spark came along, basically to do the same thing, but in memory, right? So what it does is that, unlike a database that whenever you do a, a SQL statement, pulls everything from hard drive and gives you the data, with Spark, you don't have to do that every time. You can cache some of the data in memory, let's say for a modeling uh, routine that you wanna do, and then uh, you know run some stuff and then do the collection afterwards. So it gives you that extra step that becomes very useful once you start getting really into Spark. So the way that Spark works is again, very similar. If you're familiar with Hadoop, how Hadoop works is that, um, the the same secret sauce but instead of being just hard drive it's actually in memory so what it does is that it takes your big original file right let's say it's uh the, the all the transactions are in a folder they add up to you know let's say one terabyte of data right so what uh spark does is that it splits it into what they call partitions in this case i'm i'm symbolizing three partitions right uh and what it does is that it takes those partitions and gives them to each of the machines inside the Spark cluster, right? Um, not only gives uh, one partition to each of the machines, it also gives them a copy that they can share, right? So you can see, pardon me, that the blue partition here is in two Spark um, servers. The green one is in two Spark servers as well as the red one. So it tries to kind of give those pieces and copies of those pieces to different spots of the machines. In the Hadoop world, that actually was really nice because if one machine failed, you didn't lose your data because there was copies of the thing somewhere else, right? With Spark does the same thing. But what it does, instead of it being like a fail safe, what it does is makes it much faster to find the data that you need because the data, now you don't have one server trying to find, you know, out of the one terabyte data to find the thousand customers you're looking for, it has three machines, each one with their own piece of the, the puzzle, looking for a thousand customers. One finds 300, another one finds 300, another one's 400, and then becomes one. They all put it together and they give it to you, right? So it's much more efficient and in memory. So that's the whole secret sauce, right? That how, that's how Spark was in a large cluster. And that's why it becomes very efficient for us, uh, especially uh, as you know, we run, uh, queries or we run models against large data sets. So this is how you would do it. Um, I think I just mentioned what I, what's here. So what we do um, is that 
Yeah, I got ahead of myself. So what we do is like we send the request and then because each machine has its own piece of the puzzle, they all come back and they, they all do it at the same time and the results come back much faster. So how do we interact with Spark, right? So um, officially there's about two ways, right? There's two R packages that, that do this. There's the Spark R package that is being developed by the same folks that developed Spark. Uh, it, it's a good package. Um, it has um, it, there's a, it has some things that we wish it would have, and that's why we uh, at our, our studio and now Posit uh, worked in this package was because we saw that could do other things that would make it much easier for us to to learn and to interact with Spark. So the the way that I'm going to go through today is the Sparkly R way, and that's how you can ask Sparkly R. Uh, it's kind of like a play on words of Spark Deep Layer because it has the Deep Layer integration. So Sparkly R is the work that came out uh, of the amalgamation of the two. That's that's the origin. So Sparkly R uh, is how we're going to do this, right? So how do we how do we then think about uh, data science with R and Spark, right? Never a replacement, right? We're, we're not trying to compete again against anyone. We're just trying to make it as easy as possible for you as you're adding more uh, you know, capabilities to an, uh, analytics tools that if you can interact with it through R, it's much easier because down to the communication, you'll be able to have everything in one document that says, this is the data that we had and these are the results at the bottom, right? So we think in terms of um, pushing all this uh, work into Spark and then the work that cannot be done in Spark, such as a visualization, but we bring back to R, right? The visualization, the communication, we can do in R uh, natively, but the processing of the data, such as importing or reading the data, right? Uh, uh, tidying the data, transforming the data, doing the modeling, all that stuff can be done away from our laptops, away from uh, the server where we are logged in, let's say in uh, you know, our studio server, uh, we can actually use the Spark cluster to do all that for us, right? So that's that's what, how we want to think in terms of. So that way, because you're connecting to the Spark cluster via uh, R, then the code still R is running Spark in the back end, right? But the, the code that you're writing Spark is R, excuse me. Uh, and then it's a lot easier for us not only to debug what we're working on, but also when we come back a year later, and we're trying to figure out, okay, we need to you know, improve the weight. So we need to uh, consider this new field because it's, it's new, so six months old. Then it's a lot easier for us to, to, to understand what we did a year ago and, uh, and do the updates and, and you know, rerun the model or whatever we were doing. So the main thing that I want to make sure that uh, we think in terms of uh, for R and Spark is that we want to push the compute, right? We want to make the everything that has to do with a calculation, we can push to our back end, right? Uh, in the outset, uh, my background that was mentioned, I'm also the uh, co author uh, uh, of a package called DB Plier. Uh, that's a package mainly developed by Hadley. I was just co author because I added some more stuff that, that we needed to have for databases such as Microsoft SQL or Oracle and things like that. It has the same idea that whenever we're talking about a SQL capable backend, such as Spark or a database, we want to think in these terms. We want to think that we want to push as much of the compute and then bring back the results. The reason why I'm saying this is because I've gotten so many uh, calls with uh, different positive customers that we have, and this is something that they are still struggling with. They import, you know, they use Spark. Uh, or the database as a downloading location, right? As an ETL thing that all they do is they download all the files or download a copy of the database locally. And then they try to run the models locally. It's like, that is like the worst way you can do this because you have this whole other server that can do all this stuff for you already, especially the initial EDA that you may do where you're doing like aggregation, some filtering and things like that. M most of that work can be pushed over there. So. That, that's why like, if you take anything from today, think in those terms, as you're working with databases or Spark, think in terms of pushing computation to the, the backend, which is Spark or the database. How do you do that? We're about to, to learn here, sorry. We're about to learn here because I'm about to switch to 
uh, the examples that we're going to run through today so you can see. Okay, so uh, I'll go ahead and switch. Uh, and while I get this ready, it, if anyone has a question, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer real quick before we start the, the examples here. Go right ahead. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, that quick uh, introduction. It was very much uh, insightful, but a very quick one from my own end. So, because you are talking about working with Spark in R that we don't need imports. So, let me take, for instance, I have a data set in which I want to run some model using Sparkly R. And the, the size of that model, uh, you know, when working with R, if we have uh, a data, a model we are trying to train that will take a lot of computing space. Uh, it will take even days for R to even run this model and give us the results. So switching to Sparkly R, so what is in terms of the speed? So what, how will this, is it going to look like when working with this model using Sparkly R? How am I going to speed up this process in which I can get my outputs? That's a great question. So um, I'll go ahead and switch back to the presentation to uh, because I do have a slide for that uh, to address that specific thing. So uh, even though this is for tuning, uh, which is one of the aspects of sometimes why it takes a long time for you to get your results back because you're doing like a grid tuning for a database and that takes a long time. So what you do in the tuning case, um, let's say each computer, each node in your Spark cluster uh, should be able to take like one model and run it. So if you're going to run 20, 300 models uh, because you're retuning everything, uh, each node will be able to share the load, right? So that's the bottom line because how is it going to be faster? Uh, and that should have been my short answer to your question because the more machines that you have in your Spark cluster, the more you're going to be able to share the load of whatever job you're running. Right, uh, it works. It's the same idea when it comes to a uh, single big model. Right uh, now, there's some limitations, of course, when it comes to the math part of it. Uh, there's going to be certain things with a linear regression that cannot be shared. But what they do is they optimize. When I say they, I'm talking about the Spark folks that develop this. They optimize those models as much as possible so that even a large model can be shared across multiple nodes, multiple servers, so that they can, you know. Uh, run through it a lot faster. Uh, and something I'm not going to show today, obviously, because I'm going to be running Spark in my laptop, but that's the idea of how, how Spark works, and that's how it would uh, accelerate it. Having said that, the very usual what happens is that, uh, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I do want to make sure I, I say this, is that I, I'm getting, I get into the call, some situation where I could ask, oh, how can I run my, uh, my R model in Spark? And, and I'm like, is that a very specific model that you need? Like, the, it, you know, is the math so new that only R can do that? And typically not. Typically they want, oh no, I want to run a linear regression. I was like, okay, if you want to run a linear regression or a random forest model or something that's more, uh, I want to say common, right? Uh, amongst us is common. Uh, then use the uh, algorithms that comes with Spark, right? So yes, there's a way you can run R code inside Spark but that's not efficient, right? What you want to do is don't use a LM, right, for, for your linear regression, but use linear, uh, linear regression uh, function in, that comes with Spark VR, right? So that's the other recommendation I would have uh, for that. Hopefully that, that answers the question. Cool, uh, I'll go ahead and move on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, what I ended up doing here is that I uh, I opted for taking um, and I keep talking about the site I haven't shown it yet. Let me go ahead and show it. So, if you go to spark.studio.com, eventually becomes sparkposit.com. Uh, uh, well, uh, this is where if you go to guides, this is guides of all the different aspects of, you know, of the Spark and our work. So I'm I took some of these into and put them in a, uh, in a uh, repo under the Spark, Spark VR intro uh, repo that I have under my talks repo, uh, which is what we're talking about today. So all this is available. Uh, you'll be able to run it yourself. 
uh, I, and again, that's why I know the reasons why I wanted to use my local laptop to show you. So you can see that whatever I'm showing today, you can you should be able to do it at home as well. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to do here, even though I am not going to run it here because I already ran it. And as I mentioned earlier uh, in our preparation aspect of this, um, if I forget doing this, is that uh, in order for you to, to get uh, going with Spark VR, you can go install packages, uh, Spark VR, and then uh, you know you load it here, and then you can say Spark install. So what that does is that that will install a local version of Spark in your machine, right? Um, you have to make sure that you have Java installed in your laptop. Uh, and once you have that and the Java home set, uh, which is usually happens when you install Java, so it shouldn't be that complicated, um, the Spark install will copy a, uh, a version of Spark in your laptop. So the, the stuff that I'm gonna go through today will run in your laptop. So uh, one of the things that we're talking about with Javier and Kevin, uh, the, the two other co-authors of the Spark for our book, is that we we figured that it, this was not only a good way of learning R with Spark, but also learning Spark. Because there's a lot of aspects of Spark that are, are, are true locally, and it's, it's better that you learn them locally and then learn the stuff, the big stuff when it comes to a cluster. Once you get in a cluster, uh, you already know a lot of it, right? Now you're just learning how to optimize for a cluster, right? So that, that's another way. And I'll show you here how it's gonna look. So this is, uh, I'm gonna say how to install Spark with uh, Spark PR. So I'll have that as part of my presentation here. So you'll have the steps. All right, so one of the things that we're gonna do is that we're gonna do a Spark Connect. And what this does is that the Spark Connect uh, is a general function that connects us to Spark. So when I say local as my master, it's going to create that local session. Let's say that you're working on an organization that has a data lake. Uh, you would change this to say something such as uh, Yarn. So it'll try to use the components inside your server where you're at to, uh, to connect to the cluster. Uh, or you can, if you have a standalone cluster, you will say the URL. So HTTP, oh no, it's a URL with the contents, uh, 1691, like this. And I think it's 77, something to that. You have it there. So it's very flexible, right? So it's always going to be Spark Connect, but you're going to give the, uh, the, the master. And all that is in the site, uh, all that information. So right now I have a new Spark session in running in my laptop. How do I know that? I can click here in the interface when I go to Spark. You'll notice that I have Spark jobs, right? So magically switched over to my, uh, my uh, web browser and now it's showing me that my machine, my, my laptop is running Spark, right? So that's, that's another notion that's kind of new when it comes to Spark users is that um, it, it has a notion of a session, right? So in R, um, it's very similar how you have your session here in your console, um, but it's not, a, not as specific as it is with, uh, oh, someone having issues? Can somebody confirm that I'm sharing my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. Uh, and when I switched over to the Spark Jobs, can you see that too? Yes. Okay, excellent, thank you. So. So that's the, that's the idea, right? So um, it'll start a new session for me whenever I connect to local and it'll start running Spark, um, it, but it's during that session. So um, you'll see here that has different tabs. It has the jobs. We have had no jobs yet that we ran. Uh, we have the stages, the storage and environment. You see all these are empty. Uh, well, no, it's an environment. Uh, the executors, which is only gonna be my one laptop. So that's my only executor and the SQL that I ran. Uh, so a couple of them for my connection. So hey, I'm gonna go, welcome. So I'm gonna go back to jobs and then um, I'll go ahead and copy uh, two two data sets, the flights data set. So you'll notice that I'm using the deep layer copy to, right? So copy to um, what it does is 
essentially exports the data into uh, into Spark. I pressed it twice. There you go. Uh, into Spark. So um, it, it's, it's it uploads it right. It uploads the data. This <laughs> um, this uh, copy tool. If you're ever in a real situation where you have huge data sets. Uh, like, like the question here from Sam Reed, um, is that don't load it into R and then do copy to. And what you do is you let uh, Spark read those files directly. And I'll show you here in a little bit how you do that. Um, so that's that's how we would do that. So we would uh, start a new, new Spark session and, and then import those files directly or read them directly from Spark. And I'll show you here in a minute, but first I'm gonna do this part. So what you do, uh, you'll notice that Airlines and flights are visible here in my connections pane, which is the first time we ever used the A connections pane back in version one for our studio. That was 2018. Yeah, 18. Uh, so if I switch back and I refresh, oops, sorry. If I refresh, you'll notice that there's some jobs now. These are the jobs that were used to upload the data. And the other thing I wanna show you here, uh, the, the stages for the jobs, and I should have had some data and storage. I guess I don't at this point. I guess it's so small yet. Um, so here I have uh, airlines and you notice it has the information for airlines and then for flights, you have the, uh, the fields and then I can click on this table and it will show me the data, right? So, what we would assume is that the flights um, variable here would be a data set, right? But it's not, it's a list as per R. And what this object is, is really just a pointer to where the data is inside Spark, right? So in, it casts all this information that tells us, hey, whenever I refer to this, uh, this variable, right? Uh, even though it's a pointer to where it says Spark, treat it as if it was a data table uh, or a data frame in, in your R session. That's basically what we're doing here. We're not, I'm not saying tricking R, but what I'm saying is like uh, R can pretend that this object is a table and I'll show you here in a, in a bit how you do that. So this is the, the airlines one, right? So the same thing, it's, it's also a, uh, it's just a pointer. This is very important because let's say that uh, you have a, uh, a data set that is so big, like you know, uh, in a data warehouse or something, or in a data lake. Uh, what you do, you would do is like my table, my big table. You would do um, table uh, sc, and then you would say. Uh, big table name, right? So that this would be like the table name once you connect to that data lake. So this, my big table will not be the, let's say one terabyte size data, it's just a pointer. So that's the trick, right? That I'm not importing everything into my, uh, into my uh, memory. I am simply telling, hey, Spark, whenever I'm talking about my big table, is that thing over there, right? So that's step one. I'm gonna put this here. Record, so you'll have it later. Step two is how do we do operations on top of that uh, quasi table, right? Um, so that's where it gets tricky because we wouldn't be able to use, uh, let's say a flight table, right? Year, this would be no, it doesn't know how to pull like R natively, it doesn't know how to do this part, right? I couldn't either do this where I say, you know, just year. Right, that is not useful. It's not uh, like our native operations are not useful. But what is useful is the fact that Dplyr does understand that uh, when I when I say select, you know, for selecting fields against a pointer, a sparkly R table, I don't try to use the same thing as I used if it was local. What I do is I run a different operation. So it it would work here, right? I'm selecting uh, year uh, today. So it's going year, month, day, right? I have a delay and departure delay. 
So it selected the exact ones that I needed. So how did it do that, right? It does that by doing this. It actually converts the select uh, verb from dplyr into a SQL statement. That's the, another secret sauce, right? That's how we do this. So it makes it so much easier for us not to have to switch mentally between uh, dplyr and SQL uh, as far as when we, how we write SQL. We write our stuff in dplyr regardless if it's local or if it's something in Spark or really something in a database, like I mentioned earlier, that um, dplyr uh, through the packages such as SparkLyr and dbplyr know what kind of exact SQL to use in order for SparkLyr to respond, excuse me, for Spark to respond, uh, which is uh, a syntax of SQL very, uh, that is same as Hive. So as you may know, uh, there's different dialects of SQL, right? Even within same versions of, uh, let's say like Oracle has its own dialect, uh, but even from an old version to a new version of Oracle, there's variances. Uh, we have actually coded those in. So dplyr is smart enough to switch between the dialects to use the proper one to get the request done. So that's how this works. So what's neat about it is I don't have to think about this, right? I just think about it as if it was a table, right? Same thing if I want to do a filter, right? I do filter, right? And then it just works, right? Um, I could do this the deep layer way, right? And it just works. So this is where it comes really nice because another thing I can do, uh, you notice that this becomes a SQL statement. Uh, using show query, I can see SQL statement, right? Uh, what's very nice about this is that I can literally start building these as if modularly, just like we do today in, in, in dplyr, right? I can take uh, the some of the code from another piece and put it here or add it in between, and, and this would work, right? And, I can, and what it does, just a more complex query, which is totally fine, right? Um, now, I don't know about you. I worked in, in in SQL for a very long time. I used to do operation reporting, then moved into uh, business intelligence. Everything was Microsoft based. So I wrote SQL all day long. I rather do iterative work using deep layer commands that I can modularly put wherever I need versus having to do the same thing in SQL. Because for me to do the same thing in SQL, I have to insert, right? Uh, where the, the commands have to go. But with dplyr, it, I just add the line, right, of the extra step. So this is one of the big things about being able to switch over into these kinds of interfaces. Uh, same thing, um, I just have the example here where you can have a range, you see that it works. Uh, summarize works as well. So summarize here, you, you can see the, the query. So it's saying select average. So it does the actual SQL where it's how it's supposed to work. Uh, so all the main ones for Sparkly R works. Uh, we also have uh, Tidy R works uh, for the pivot longer and pivot wider. Um, that, that works if you use them. Um, and then, the, of course, we, we talk about being able to do this uh, through the pipes and things like that. Um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. Let's see, yeah, I don't want to, uh, let, me, let me move on from this step. Um, another thing I can do, because it has this notion of jobs, everything that I did, you'll notice now I'm 14 jobs. Every single thing that I did, you know, with the arrange and select and all that, created a job here. Uh, so I'll show you, for example, if I take this, it can give me some information, right? Uh, remember it was 14. If I refresh, now it's 15. See, so everything I do becomes a job inside Spark. I'm gonna keep on going through here. All right, so uh, once I'm done with my session, I should close it. So when I do Spark Disconnect, you'll notice that now I don't have anything here and this is gone, right? So um, that, that, would, that would be it. All right, um, so real quick, I'm gonna uh, answer the question about uh, how did you read, and I'll put this at the end. Um, Reading files. So for reading files, you would do, um, 
a Spark read a CSV, and then you would say, uh, you would give it the, the location, right? Uh, what's really neat about this is that it works really similar to how it works with big data, that what you do is you say SC, which is the connection, right, uh, that you would have, and then the path equals uh, path to, um, to folder. So the folder that contains all your CSV files uh, will be read. It, we, we treat it as a one big table, right? So that, that's what's so neat about it, that you don't have to, unlike other, like uh, our packages that we used to kind of having to do an iterative run of all of it, right? Like an LApply or a for loop or something like that that reads all the files. With uh, Spark, um, the way it works is that you can push, uh, point it to a folder and it'll read all of them. Of course, you can do, do this if you want. Uh, my file .csv, that's totally valid. But the preference is that you run it like this. The reason why it's because uh, that more likely that will grow as well, right? As you're capturing more days of work, you just push in the files into the, the folder and, and everything's just gonna be read at the same time. Um, so, so that's how you would do it. So the other thing is that what you can do is that um, you would say my table, so once you do that, then my table will become the pointer, right? Uh, if you do this, uh, so let's let's say that you do this. So this is uh, uh, way one. This is way two. This is more complex, but you may need it at one point. So uh, way two it would be, and the name name equals uh, table one, right? So what you do is like if this is this will read it into Spark and you may not want to have a variable yet and then later on you want one then you can say my table is um, table sc and then table one so now the pointer becomes so th that's why you use table to say hey go this is where my table is so that's how that would work um, the other piece that I'm not going to go through into detail today is the um, managing the spark cache uh for for the question about the the 10 gigabytes uh, thing uh, i would i would go to this article to read up on how to to manage that because another thing i can do is to tell spark not to read it all at the same time and i think this is where you're going what you do is you say um, uh, memory equals false so what that does is that it uh, maps the files it doesn't import them into memory because especially if you're on your laptop, it won't import them into memory. It'll just map them. And then uh, as you're asking questions, it'll actually query the files themselves ad hoc. So it'll do that in, in, uh, on disk. Uh, this had, until Arrow came out, this was the only way you could do these kinds of things, these kinds of operations. Um, and yes, so uh, fread and room would work if you want to import everything on uh, in memory. Um, in fact, room and read are today uh, are uh, it can do the lazy reading, so you don't have to read like import everything at the same time. I would recommend that you would look at that. Uh, but if we're talking about um, uh, you know operations that you want to eventually have just on. Uh, that only R can run, like I said, a model that you only want to run through R, then yeah, I would say either Room or Read R would work better. Uh, just make sure that you have those um, flags set to not, uh, to, to not bring them into memory yet. I forget the name of it, uh, but in Spark, this is how you would do it. Okay, so uh, let me go to the next uh, thing I wanted to show. Uh, Okay, uh, thing I wanted to show. So we saw how um, I was able to import, um, uh, excuse me, upload the data, and then uh, be able to use uh, uh, DeepLayer to interact with my data. Uh, again, if you're in an organization that doesn't have Spark but has databases, I would recommend that you look at the DBPlyer package because it would basically do the same thing where you can use DBPlyer Deep Layer to, to run those queries. Um, so now we're going to go outside of what um, it's uh, it's available through a database. Uh, in this case, with uh, pipelines. 
uh, so what is a pipeline? Uh, so uh, this is going to be just this, like up to this point, we'll talk about intro only. So I do want to talk a little bit more advanced stuff. Uh, I, again, I don't expect, you know, everyone to, to retain all this. Uh, but what I would, I would say is that just know that the wide field that Spark offers uh, without being too much platitudes into, oh, it'll, you know, it'll run models and clusters and it'll do this and, you know, wash your clothes and iron your clothes. So I don't want to be like that. I want to show you some stuff that it's okay. If it's not fully understood, um, but hopefully as you uh, are confronted by situations where you may need to know how to do a pipeline or may need to say, oh, how do I really do my machine learning in Spark with R? Uh, this you can come back to this and see it. Um, oh yeah, rumor gets or something about it, so I can come see. So that's kind of like the expectation I would have uh, for for this team. Um, and, and I'm, I'm saying this team. I'm saying if I were to give this talk anywhere, uh, it would be the same kind of thing. I give talks like this, uh, a lot of them uh, to Spanish uh, folks as well. So I try to to show this because I know that uh, it was my case too that even though things I won't use today, I may use it later. So how is that, what is a pipeline, right? Uh, a pipeline is, um, it's a very interesting object. Um, it, we can think in terms of a pipeline, uh, very similar to how it works with uh, uh, in dplyr. So this is a little trick that you would have in dplyr, uh, the dot, right? Uh, technically, without getting too much into dplyr, I can say empty cars and say mutate, uh, dot, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, x equals a m plus one. So this works because the dot is like implication that is the data that's coming here. So it's like a like a placeholder, right? Uh, we don't we don't use it because it, the way that how deep layer is coded is that it's implied that the dot is there, right? Um, so whenever you start with a dot. Um, it's actually kind of like a blank thing. So you'll notice that there's no data, right? There's no empty cars at the beginning here. It's a very weird thing that the first time you see it, you're like, what? Um, but it's actually, that's how dplyr works, right? Because this it's lazy. We call it lazy in the sense that it doesn't operate in every step. It waits till the end of it and it says, okay, this is how all these operations are gonna go, is that we can do this, right? So it knows the number of operations. So I say, uh, when I run data through here, Right? This is what I'm telling it. When I run my data through here, I want you to uh, make these changes to paste C to the cylinder number. And then I want you to run a model on top of this uh, and, that, and give me the result, right? So you'll notice that the next step here is that because I created my R pipeline becomes a sort of a function that when I run empty, empty cars through it, it gives me a, a model. So that's the idea. So uh, an empty pipeline is a pipeline that has the steps. If you have worked with tidy models, they're very similar to a recipe. Kind of like you're setting up all the steps that's going to happen before you, usually before you run a model on top of the prepared data. Uh, so this is the same idea how we saw this, how it works. So in the, the Spark world, I'm going to uh, copy the data. Spark, we're going to create a new session in Spark. Um, and once it's started, I'll show you. So you started now, so I can come back to here. And you'll see I have a brand new interface. Like it looks exactly the same, right? But it's a brand new session, right? The, the other one died. Like we don't, that doesn't exist anymore. So now it's copying the data. And we're going to look at some uh, feature transformers here. So we're going to. Have uh, yes. The F does um, takes the, the data and this, it filters the data for anything that's an A, uh, and then does some operations on the on the dates and it just selects those right. So if I were to do the F show query, we'll see that it's an operation that um, uh, that's SQL right. Uh, so we tell it to look at this transformer called FD, uh, dplyr transformer. This is the only transformer in Spark VR that does not exist in Spark world. We have other transformers that we'll look at, but this is the only one that we created 
custom so that uh, it's a lot easier for you to kind of switch over uh, in your work. So here we see a transformer, right? So this can be a transformer. Um, the other transformer that we can have is that um, that if we want to see the, the actual parameter, because this, this becomes a, an object. So if I were to, uh, to make a variable into this, we'll see that the variable, it's, it's another pointer, but has a statement because it's a, it's a transformer, uh, it's a deep layer transform. So I can extract that, okay. So um, that's the, the thing with deep layer transformers, which we've got here. So what we tell it, we tell Spark VR is for it to start a new pipeline. So just like we'd say with a dot, so this is our dot, right? We say dot, and then now I want you to do this transformation that we saw with DF over here. I want you to make all these transformations. And then I want you to run this, bin this binarizer. What binarizer does is that for arrival, uh, excuse me, departure delay. So if I were to say uh, flights to be up, does that one still work? I think it's the same name I used. Yeah. Uh, so it's the departure delay. So what I want is anything that's over 15 minutes of delay for it to say yes. So delay. So that's the binarizer, yes or no. Right? That's the feature transformer binaries. That's a spark operation. That is not a SQL operation anymore. Now we're going beyond what SQL can do. We're going to a spark can do. Could I have said, uh, you know, delay equals if else, you know, can we do mutate for that? Absolutely, we could have done that. But whenever we use these feature transformers, it works more efficiently than it would be with SQL. So that's the main thing, right? Uh, and we're gonna see some that we, yes, we could do with some uh, mutate, right? Or some select statement. Um, but uh, as we, we go deeper into it, we'll, we'll find some that we just couldn't. There's no way we can use SQL for this. So I'm just, this example is kind of like a toy example just for us to understand the concepts, but trust me that these feature transformers become very useful, especially as you work on actual use cases. Uh, the second one, the second feature transformer is the ability to uh, bucketize. So we're going to say, if the scheduled departure time is, you know, midnight to 4 a.m., that's one bucket, uh, 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. is another bucket, 8 a.m. to noon is another bucket, noon to 4 is another bucket, uh, 4 to 8 is another bucket, and uh, uh, 8 to uh, 24 hours, you know, at the end of the night, it's another bucket. So now we're going to bucketize it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add a formula. Uh, this is our, our formula, which is very funny. Spark doesn't have this concept. So this is a very... Uh, uh, we're going to say like a convenience thing for us because in the Spark world, you say these are these are my predictors and this is my outcome uh, and this is how you do it. Uh, what we do in Spark VR, we translate the formulas that in the R world we're very used to to transform it into a uh, uh, in, into the that statement that that Spark expects. So uh, so I was wrong. Uh, it's Spark. Uh, feature transformer dplyr, uh, feature transformer SQL, which I consider the same. I said one, uh, but it's actually two because the feature uh, FTR formula is another one that you need to spark PR. Hope I'm, hope I'm not corrected myself again later, but I think that's it. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna run this and you'll notice that uh, flights pipeline I'm gonna, now has uh, now has all the all the steps, very similar to a recipe. It knows what it's gonna do, but you notice that I have not run the data through it, right? It's uh, an empty pipeline. Uh, so if you see here, this pipeline has five stages. One of the things, uh, and Kevin is, uh, uh, has moved on to do some other stuff, but this is Kevin Kuo's work. Uh, I wanna highlight it because I thought this is one of the coolest printouts ever. Uh, not other, like not even Spark, you can see this printout. It's so nice to see uh, each of these steps very easily uh, described, uh, not too much information. You can see all the stages on your, on your pipeline, right? I, I just love that. Um, so the, the, this pipeline I can mention is basically empty. Um, if you were to think kind of like, uh, 
uh, those like Tom and Jerry cartoon where you drop the little ball and the ball goes on top of a, a fork and the fork throws it and comes into a mice mouse trap and mouse trap snaps and tosses the ball. This is basically what we're looking at, right? The, it's all prepared, right? But we haven't run the ball through it. There's no no data through it yet. So we're going to uh, partition some data that's also available through Spark. Now I have a partition. So the ML fit is what's going to say, OK, take the little ball here, uh, run it through all that. So it's going to do that. So now it's running my data uh, through the partition, the, the, excuse me, the partition of the data. So I took a part of the flights. And that's what I'm going to run uh, as a little ball through all the steps. Uh, so I can get my what we call fitted pipeline. So we got an empty pipeline and a fitted pipeline. Why the difference? Why do we want it different? Well. Imagine now that it's a year from now. And now, because the customer uh, behavior ha may have changed, uh, you need to get new coefficients for your model, right? So this fitted pipeline already has coefficients. You cannot refit this pipeline. This, this uh, uh, it already has its own thing, right? So it's its own thing. So for you to run it, run it again, Right, run the ML fit again, you're gonna use the empty pipeline because now the, the little ball, the new data is totally new data, right? It's a year from now and you run new data. So now you want to keep your, your uh, empty pipeline because that way it's just like drop it. And now you have all the same steps that you did a year ago are running again exactly the same way. Obviously if you don't change the code, but would run exactly the same way and it would give you new coefficients, right? Which is what we really want to, we'll be going after, right? Or if it's a random forest or new you know, trees and things like that, but usually it's coefficients. So that's the big difference. So one is empty, the other one has the coefficients. I want to keep the old one, the, the, the original one because I may run new data through it, you know, every so often, and then I can use for the new pipeline. And then in order to run predictions, right? We use ML transform. Why not ML predict? Because we're not only running the uh, the transform, excuse me, the model, the model predictions. We're running those transformations as well, right? Because the the partition testing. If I go through this uh, partition, you notice that it doesn't have doesn't have the buckets, doesn't have the binary information, doesn't have all this other stuff that the model needs to run the prediction, right? So it's gonna do the it's gonna do the bucketing and all that for for you, and then give you the prediction, right? So that's why we call it ML transform and not ML predict, uh, because it's doing more than just that one thing. Another cool thing about the pipeline is that you can save it. What what do I mean by save it? I mean that you can literally create uh, a file in uh, based on your model that can now run without any R dependencies. So that's huge, right? Because usually what happens is that whenever we go uh, as R users and we go and face a situation where there's big data, there's a data lake and all that stuff, that the model that we created now has to be recreated by a big data engineer because they cannot run the same R code that you can uh, to run the, uh, you know, the predictions or run the model, right? You kind of working on a copy of the data and trying to figure out what are the, the right variables or weights and stuff like that and then do the recommendation well through because how uh, the the saving is done here you literally can do the whole thing you can create the model um or rather the transformations that go into the model and then save the pipeline both the fitted pipeline and the the unfitted pipeline as objects that uh, are uh, Scala native. So it creates your code for Scala and that runs, uh, so you have your big data engineer, instead of having to recreate the thing for you, it will, uh, it, he, he or she can take that and make it part of whatever other pipeline that they're running uh, on a regular basis or whatever to run the predictions, right? Now they can run that without having to install R or whatever else they would need to uh, in uh, whatever production thing they have. So that's big advantage, right? Uh, that's one thing that I just love the fact that we, we can do this. So we're not shut out of having to have uh, an end product that really feels production ready. 
Um, and also you can reload your model, right? So again, let's say a year from now, you want to reload uh, the, the fitted model or the, the unfitted model, more likely the unfitted model because you want to run new, uh, uh, new data like I have here. Uh, oh, this is not the new data. This is for the fitted model, isn't it? Let's see, how did I say it? Yeah, so the fitted pipeline. So this would kind of like a, um, a recreation of how it would work, right? So you could run it also inside R if you wanted to, but more likely you run it uh, somewhere else. Uh, and then this, this is where I was going to talk to. So I reloaded the pipe, the, the pipeline, not the fitted pipeline, but the empty one. And then I can run the new model and then save that new model, right? So it's all within the thing. Okay. Um, I have two other things, actually three other documents that I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, obviously, but uh, now I'm going from talking about machine learning, right? Uh, talking about uh, pipelines. The next step is kind of brings everything together. But before that, I don't know if there's any other questions. I know we the last half hour here. And since we are putting the questions, I am going to take the, the few more minutes to be able to, to show the rest uh, as far, more as I can. All right, so let me share this real quick. <clears throat> no, didn't want to share like this. Slideshow. So this is the main takeaway, right? So kind of giving you uh, where we at. So the next slide is uh, grid tuning. Uh, one of the things that I found so cool about Spark is being able to do grid tuning, um, which again, goes plays real well into the strengths of Spark, um, which I'll show here in a minute why, but um, with grid tuning would work, uh, would work very similar to how it would work with, uh, let's say tidy models, for example. Uh, the idea is that uh, you want to test different, uh, uh, different parameters, right? Very popular one that we usually give the example of is the number of trees, right? So we say, you know, as you can add more trees to your random forest, but there's a point in which the, the adding more trees doesn't benefit you, doesn't improve the predictions. So you, you don't want to, you may not want to go beyond that because obviously it takes more work. Uh, in some cases, uh, it actually gets worse, right? So you definitely don't want to get to that point, right? So that's, that's another thing. Uh, yes, somebody has a question. Okay, there's a question in the chat box. I think it's an add-on to Samrit's question. Could f read function or VROM work with Spark? Right. Um, or maybe so, any other data source or something, maybe Excel or something, maybe we can capture that and yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I did uh, review that uh, and I did mention that. Uh, so, so the answer is, uh, f read and room would work if you were to try to import the data into R and if you want to do operations and only you can do an R, right? That wouldn't be possible in Spark. And that's typically a some weird transformation or some weird model. I say weird, I'm talking about very esoteric new model that only exists in an R package. That may be a reason why you want to do that. But if, um, if the idea is that what I want to do is I have that 10 gigabyte file that I want to read and I have six gigabytes of memory, uh, my options are definitely not f -read because f -read will bring everything in, uh, but Vroom or read R will allow you to do something very similar that Spark does, which is to map that file, right? So it'll find out, uh, it'll figure out its shape, right? Uh, the, the fields that it has and the type, so whenever you do a query to it, it'll go and get that information ad hoc. So it'll be more efficient. The whole point is that you more likely will not need the 10 gigabytes. You may need specific fields and specific sections. So you may not eventually need to run all 10 gigabytes, but there may be cases where you do and then you just run a memory. There's no, there's no much we can do after that. Uh, the other thing you can do is use Arrow. Arrow is more much efficient when it comes to that. Uh, in fact, it's being built for that, to be able to analyze data that's bigger than RAM locally. Uh, with Arrow, you could do that, 
the limitations are the arrow does not support models yet. So you would be able to do uh, aggregations and filtering and things like that, but not models. You would have to import the data into R, like if you have the sample data that you want, bring it into, uh, uh, into R proper as an R data frame and then run the model that way. But at that point, you will have been able to do summarizations and things like that, uh, such as the EDA that we do to, uh, to get uh, some, some things. Uh, in, uh, in your laptop, again, if we could stay in there, uh, you could use uh, Spark and Sparkly R to do that. In fact, some years back, somebody did that with a bunch of Amazon reviews that were so much bigger than its memory. And, and he did exactly that. He uh, pointed the, um, the file, the, uh, excuse me, the, the Spark session to the, the folder where the files are, as I mentioned earlier on the example that I recorded. Uh, excuse me, not recorded, but saved so you see it. Uh, and then he only uh, worked with the data that could be modeled inside the Spark session. So Spark tried to do its best to, to only load the data that it needed. Uh, but again, th the laptop that that person had was a little bit bigger. Uh, uh, and it was a lot of data that he was successful with it. So there's still limitations based on that. The, the point to me or it's going to make is that you could run models on that data that you don't have to import, uh, but still there's going to be some, some data that you would need uh, to get imported. Uh, so it's, you know, that, that's that's best scenario at that point. Hopefully that helps. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and go back to this real quick. Um, so, sorry. So when we talk about tuning, uh, and I was mentioning the, the number of trees, right? So you have the trees, uh, if you add more trees, uh, you may not gain as much uh, accuracy uh, after let's say 50 trees, you know, you don't want to do 100 trees because you do the same thing or you could get worse, right? So you definitely don't want to do that. So what you do here is that you say, Hey, I have this pipeline, right? That's the thing that with Spark, uh, unlike Teddy uh, models, uh, you do need a pipeline, right? Uh, and actually similar to Teddy models, you kind of do need a recipe or a workflow. So you can think of it like that. You will create your pipeline that has the transformations and then uh, run those transformations uh, with, that includes the modeling through that grid search. So it'll, let's say that you had number of, uh, number of trees and some other field, like some other uh, tuning parameter, um, that could be also part of the pipeline. Let's say, for example, which we will see the number of terms. Like if I were to do a, a text-based one, text-based model, uh, number of terms that are extracted from the, the text, uh, that can increase or decrease. The increase is obviously, it's, more, it's, it's a bigger model, but it may be better, right? So you can actually say, take these four number of, um, uh, four specific number of terms that I want, and they take these four specific number of trees that I want. And what it'll do, it'll, that's four times four, right? So it'll be 16 combinations that you'll have um, that would run in the tuning. And then what you can kind of imagine is that the, it's gonna run the transformation with the model and then give you a metric, which is like how, how I did in accuracy, right? So in this case, you can see where Spark works really nicely because instead of you having to work uh, worry about parallelism inside your laptop. Uh, in this case, you're thinking in terms of you can run this across all the cluster, like I mentioned earlier to the, the first question about uh, being able to run models faster. It'll run faster than in your laptop or in a big computer because instead of just having one big computer run all of these combinations, the 16 combinations, you'll have three, you know, in some cases you have 20. Uh, nodes or servers running a single Spark cluster uh, all together running that information, right? And remember what I mentioned earlier that not only the ability to distribute those discrete, uh, in this case, uh, tuning models, uh, but also you have the ability to uh, uh, distribute the data that those models will consume. So the consumption of data is a lot faster, the, the the uh, prioritization of the models is automatic. You don't even have to think about it and you'll see it. Uh, and then it just, it, it'll be much a much faster proposition. Uh, so this is cross-validation. So for cross-validation, uh, 
the idea is that you can do folds. So instead of having like one combo that runs here, so you can imagine kind of like, if you were to take this combo one and kind of zoom into this, this is kind of like the zoom, right? So we have the combo, you know, one, right? And you do the resample, right? So you have three resamples, and each of them fit, good the evalu evaluation, and then give you the, the average. Very similar how it works in regular machine learning. All this is like so easy to set up in, in, in Spark that it's like, wow, you know, it's, uh, it's almost like way too easy to do in Spark uh, when, it, when it comes to data preparation, running these things. Uh, and then what I mentioned earlier, that the, this is where you can see the ability of a, a Spark cluster again, uh, that can run multiple uh, uh, multiple models at the same time because each laptop, each, each server in your, in your cluster is running different ones. Having said that, I want to clarify too that you don't need an expensive server or servers to run Spark. You can literally have cheap laptops that you connect to a network and install Spark in each of the laptops and you'll have your own uh, you know, at home or at, at your institution, you'll have your own server. Obviously, uh, you that those laptops I'm talking about, some a laptop that nobody uses, right? It doesn't have to be like a super laptop. You have six, ten laptops hooked up to the same network, all of them running Spark. You can start Spark as a local, excuse me, as a, uh, a standalone cluster, and now you have your own cluster that can do that. So when I say that, it's usually we think in terms of like, oh, an IT optimize super cluster, yes, those exist. But the whole point of open source, right, is that we could do this at home if we needed to. The way I started was using AWS to create these kinds of things. And I would do like three or four EC servers that were the cheapest one they had and create my, my cluster there and run the thing. So, so that's the other thing that, that you can think in terms of that this is, yes, this is really cool, uh, but it's also very accessible if you wanna, if you wanna test it out and maybe become a, even a, a big data engineer that has this R background. That's, that's really cool too. So see, I got about 15 minutes. Let me switch over to, um, so I'm going to skip, uh, I'm gonna go to the last one because that one's kind of brings everything together, but you'll see it running. Um, I am going to restart. Okay. Oh, shoot, 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 shoot. I don't want to run everything. Okay. So I'm starting a new R session and I'm gonna wait for this to be available. And I'm gonna copy some data to it. Um, This data is already, um, it's some cell data. I actually copied this example from uh, example in tidy models. So we're splitting the data and then uh, we're creating a, uh, we're creating a pipeline. So the ML pipeline that I have here, uh, it's basically going to a formula and then a random forest and the pipeline, right? So what I wanna do is that I want to have the number of trees, right? So I mentioned earlier uh, that I can do that, right? So I want to do uh, five trees, 10 trees, all the way to 100 trees, right? So I wanna see what is my optimal number of trees. Um, and then what I want to do is that uh, for each of these trees, we, I want to know how it did, right? but how it does, it actually is kind of open, right? It could, there's uh, several measurements that you can do. In this case, I chose accuracy. So it's going to run accuracy. That's going to be my, um, what we call evaluator. Um, again, this example is going to be available to you and it's going to, it's available on the site. Uh, so that's what we'll, we'll use for, uh, for this because the outcome uh, so I can spend that properly. The outcome that we're going to use is, 
what's the outcome? Ba, ba, ba. It's multi-class, which is, and we'll go back here. Yeah, uh, so you see class, right? So what I say, when I say multi-class, if I mean, um, I can say TBL uh, sales uh, count, again, just like it's diplier. I don't even know the secret statement off the top of my head for that. Uh, I would say class. So you'll see this, there's two classes, right, that I have. So it's not binary, it's actually multi-class. Um, that I could treat it as that. So have the two classes that I want to do. And that's why the, uh, the evaluator is gonna be multi-class. So for model tuning, we'll have uh, our sales pipeline, which is the pipeline that I created here, right? My sales pipeline. And then uh, the cell grid, right? This is the, the parameters. And that's that um, uh, the numbers, remember, that we created. And then the evaluator that we created earlier, right? The, the multi-class stuff that I was mentioning. And then I want number of folds to be five and parallelism to be four. That means four within each server. So number of folds is what I mentioned here. Um, here. So when it does the resample, it's gonna do four of these, right? So each of these combinations, it's gonna be resampled four times to make sure that I only, if I only were to run it one time, it may give me a, a good metric just because it just happened that that piece of the data was very good. So what we do is that we split that piece into four little pieces and we do, uh, and we run it through each one and then we get the evaluation. Typically in a, in a regular model, we have to be very careful for how we, um, like Max call it, how you budget your data because you may have a limited amount of data to be able to run these kinds of uh, tuning. But usually in the, in the Spark world, in the big data world, that's not a concern. So we can run a lot of folds here because we have conceivably gigabytes of data. So it will give us a much better result because we have so much data to, to run through. So uh, I'll run it here. And now I have my, uh, my uh, this is essentially another pipeline. It's like a pipeline of the tuning that I'm going to do. And now here, I'm gonna actually run my tuning through MLFit. That's gonna go and not only run like we did earlier with the, with the initial pipeline for flights. In this case, it's running, uh, it would be four uh, folds. So four models per, per uh, iteration. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. We've got 20 um, combinations, right? So 20 combinations times four, uh, that's 80 models that we're going to run. So that's what's running right now. So 80 models in my laptop. You know, nothing impressive, but if you imagine being in a, in a cluster, 80 models will go like that because you have multiple machines, each one running one or several of the 80 models. Uh, in fact, we should be able to see them here. Oh, it looks like it completed. See? See what we got here. Oh uh, yeah, there's some that's going. Keep on going. Another thing I like about this, especially models that take a long time, unlike R, like R kind of goes boom, quiet for you know hours. You don't know what's going on here. At least you can see, you can see the jobs going. You know because it splits into smaller jobs, and you can see the, the thing progressing. So still going. Um, so the idea here is that uh, once we uh, oh it, it ran okay good. Yeah, uh, let me refresh to confirm. Yeah, so uh, so now we have our model again, uh, just like everything else, that model is gonna be big because it has all the other models, right? It has 80 models inside, but inside there are 
inside R, it's like nothing, right? It's just a pointer. It's a, it's, we're going to treat it as a model, but it's just a pointer, right? So we're, we're not like overloading our R session with, with stuff that it's, it's in, the, in the Spark cluster. So then we can extract the validation stuff. So you can see at five trees, we get 81% accuracy. With the 10 trees, we get very close to the same. It started to go up at 25 trees and kind of picks out a 40, right? So with these metrics, we, we can collect them and then we can do like a nice, you know, um, a nice GG plot, right? To tell us, hey, look, at 50, that's where, you know, we, we don't gain any more accuracy, we go 100, right? So now we know, right? And we didn't have to find out one after the other, right? Seriously, we can parallelize all these experiments in Spark and it will run much faster in a cluster. And then you can select the, the model that you wanna use, right? Uh, now that I know 50, you know, I could just manually you run the same uh, and then run the, you know, sort of my validation that stays at, you know, 83%. So, so that's really good. Um, so this is kind of like, it was the middle um, um, uh, article that I did when I went to this world and uh, I published a desk here. Um, the next one is text-based uh, and that's more complex uh, because the, the combinations, uh, when I mentioned number of features for the hashing, um, that, that is the one that we do variable and all that. So it's a lot, it's a lot more complex and we're gonna run out of time, but I encourage you to look at it as well uh, because in this case, uh, once we actually run the, uh, the model itself, we're not running 80, we're gonna run 300 combinations. And this takes a while, it takes a few minutes for it to run on my laptop. Uh, but that, that's what you can start seeing as I'm sitting there, we're not talking about big data, like this is a small data set, but it still took several minutes to run. And if you were even with a small data set, right? That's really exciting. If you use small data set, not, not something huge, maybe one gigabyte, two gigabytes, but I want to do some uh, tuning, I can use Spark, right? If I have access to a cluster and it will be much faster because again, all of them are sharing the load. So um, back to here. So um, as I've been mentioning, we have the spark.studio.com. Eventually that should become spark.posit.com. Uh, even if you keep on going to our studio.com, it's gonna be fine, it's gonna reroute you. Um, if you haven't been to the site or haven't been in a while, I've been revamping it, uh, switching over to Quarto. Uh, if you have heard of Quarto, it's the new like our markdown thing that we've got going on, uh, but better obviously, but I don't wanna minimize, but I can't talk too much about it right now. Um, so uh, the, the site has been updated. Uh, I, I've done some stuff like, especially if you're new to the to uh, Spark. Uh, let me go to the thing real quick, Spark. If you're new to Spark, uh, the get started is actually something that I worked on a lot. So I, I did a quick example at the top of the demonstration of how you can install, but this will walk you much better through how to do this, right? Uh, how to read data, prepare data, model data, like the very few steps if we want to like just very gently get into this. Uh, the, get in, the get started is actually a good, my opinion, good guide. Hopefully it'll help you. Um, so we also have the cheat sheet. It's uh, accessible through the uh, through the site. To learn more, you'll be able to pull the cheat sheet. Uh, it, it's this cheat sheet I'm very proud of because I created back in 2017 and then updated last year. Um, and it has so much more uh, things that the old one didn't have. Uh, so, and also it's black and white. So if you want to like print it, which I ended up doing, I printed it, it's not a problem with the color contrast. Also community.studio.com, that's community.fossil.com. Uh, welcome to, to join. Uh, I do answer a lot of questions there. Uh, feel free to ping me in that if you want to. Uh, thank you everyone for, for your attention. And uh, here's the link to the um, uh, to the material. Uh, give me a few minutes before uh, going so I can uh, commit the changes that I did while we're doing the presentation. And uh, and you're welcome to to the material there. So uh, again, I appreciate. Thank you for the honor for, for me being here. 
Uh, I hope this was uh, something that would be useful to you. I appreciate it. Okay, we were so we are actually honored to have you here. We just we I understand your tight schedule, and I I really appreciate you having to be with us today. So um, thank you so much. So if we have any question while he's trying to update the commit on GitHub, so please. Feel free to go into the chat box. Okay, let me get in there. Okay. Okay, great session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay, don't worry. We're going to share all the links. Um, so, and also the video is going to be available for all of us. Okay, so, so uh, the update is on now. Yeah, it's on now, and uh, I, okay. the link is shared. Yeah, and uh, I'll well I'll do to uh, I'll send you uh, the same link to our chat in LinkedIn. That way, it doesn't get lost for the link. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have it now. I have, have it now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So I would like to really appreciate Edgar for joining us today. I know I have to track and track you. I know you're <laughs> you busy, <did>. but um, <laughs> yeah, <thank you. laughs> I'm, I'm so happy the, the patience and the perseverance paid off. So um, I would really like to say it's a wonderful session because um, I've attended a lab but I got a lot of issues there, but I felt, okay, if I can get this guy, I think most of these issues will be resolved. And it's really did. I I am really grateful. The explanation was really, really impressive. Okay, we'll get into <laughs> what they're about now. <laughs> okay, so come on. Okay, so, um, and I believe from the comments we have in the chat here, we're really grateful. This is really an elementary introduction to Sparkly R. And we're, come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, so thank you. So thank you so much. We look forward to really having you some other time and we're grateful. So from all of us here in Abuja and all over the world, to all those who are joining us from across the world, thank you so much. You've always been a part of our journey and we really appreciate it. Thank you. So it's going to be a bye from here. We'll share the videos and the files. Everything is going to be available online through LinkedIn, the YouTube channel, and um, Twitter will get everything down. So thank you, everybody. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.